Chamber of Commerce's Salute to Business and Community Big Band Dinner Dance. I got through it. Yes, thank you. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jack Burnett. I'm the Executive Director of the Chamber. I'm uh, happy to uh, attempt to be your host tonight. Uh, it's uh, nice of you all to be here. We're going to do so. We're going to have a lot of fun tonight. We're going to have a great meal. We're going to honor some well-deserving people. We're going to hear some great music, uh, and uh, it's all going to be good. We'd like to uh, start by thanking our sponsors this evening. The event sponsor, as you see, follow along in the program if you'd like. But the event sponsor, of course, Public Service of New Hampshire. Gold sponsor, People's United Bank. Our silver sponsors, Rivermead, New Hampshire Ball Bearings, and the Scott for our home. And uh, so we appreciate that. Thank you. We have quite a few uh, table sponsors uh, this year. I'm going to uh, just go through them quickly. Bell Tates, Bowdoin and Dewey, Home Health Care Hospice and Community Services, Jack Daniels Motor Inn, Coffell Family or Peterborough uh, Memorials and Stoneworks, Lake Sunapee Bank, we suspended a Liberty Mutual Insurance and then up Community Hospital, New England Forest Products, Sequoia Technologies Group, and the Wireless. So, so we appreciate all of that. We're thankful too for uh, to a four star uh, catering, Basil Holly, who are the supply list of our, uh, our boutonniers for our award winners, as well as some of the floral arrangements around uh, that you see, as well as Alliance uh, Consulting, HRD helped out there. Marilyn Weir, our photographer, is here from Marilyn Weir Photography. Where are you, Marilyn? There she is. Uh, Bill Reeve uh, from Eastern Video Productions is here. Bill? So, uh, we'll be, there'll be uh, CDs of this event available for those of you who want to pass them on to your grandchildren. We uh, are thanking uh, Channel uh, 31, uh, Peterborough 31, but Channel 13 in Nashua too, they all do us a lot of uh, help in publicizing, give us a lot of help in publicizing this event. I'd also like to uh, thank the, uh, uh, probably the main mover and shaker behind this event, and that would be our Associate Director of the Chamber, Laura Keith King. Clifton, our employee not only of the year but of the century. 
Lord, as we honor these men, may we remember that it is you who has uniquely gifted us to creatively use our entrepreneurial skills and social partnerships to make it happen. It is you who go, gives opportunity to scatter seeds in order to make a difference. And it is you who commits yourself to the well-being of your people over the long haul. And for that faithfulness, for that generosity, for that inexhaustible goodness, we thank you. So Lord, join us tonight as our extra special honored guest. We know you love a good party, and this is going to be a good party. Thank you. In your name we pray. Thank you, Reverend Tim. Yes. Now, please uh, rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing while we bring to the podium Senior Chief Petty Officer, retired John Franklin, United States Navy, and John will explain to you what he is going to do. Chief. You know you can't get away with having me in an event and not get a history lesson. So you're going to get a little history lesson tonight. This song, God Bless America, was, surprise to some, not written by Kate Smith. It was, in fact, written by Irving Berlin. And it was written in 1918, as World War I was closing in on the United States. didn't go with the show that Irving Berlin wrote the song for, so he didn't put it in the show, and in fact didn't publish it that way. In 1938, as storms were again growing in Europe, he changed the song a little bit and republished it, or published it for the first time, and it was in fact introduced by Kate Smith.
to give us the work. Now, even though I realize some of you are still eating, and uh, well, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and get things moving so that we can uh, get on to our awards here uh, and then the music. The first thing we need to do here is to do something that's uh, a tradition that these banquets. And that is to uh, acknowledge our previous award winners. We're honored to have some of them uh, with us tonight. So uh, I would ask you to stand please when I call your name and remain standing for a round of applause at the end. Previous business leaders of the year have included Bob Edwards. Bob? Cliff agreed to stay on, 
In addition to general maintenance, he also was the gate master that controlled the water flow to all three hydroelectric generators, the two on New Newset River and the one at Noon's Mill. As many of you are aware, Ken King is no longer well. His daughter said her father can't even remember when he got married. If that's a sign of dementia, most of us are going to be in trouble. <laughs> uh, but when asked about Cliff, he mustered his deepest memories about how indispensable Cliff was to repurposing Noon's Mill and the, and the beautiful property that we see today. Cliff was a day-to-day -day mainstay that brought to fruition all of Ken and Sandy's ambitious projects. After Sandy King died in 2006, the property was bought by Charlie and Dudley Cobb, who are here tonight. When Cliff was brought into the office by Charlie, he thought he was going to be fired. Instead, Charlie gave him a raise, and Charlie said he knows a good thing when he sees it. At 84 years old, he still holds a part-time job at Noon's Mill. Clifton Foote started off life as a kid. <laughs> I just wanted to see if you were with me. <laughs> Clifton Foote was born in the house that he now lives in in Francistown. This was his grandparents' house. As a matter of fact, in those days, his grandmother was a midwife, and he was delivered by his grandmother. Not only that, but Cliff told me that his grandmother also delivered to him an angel, a beautiful baby girl named Elizabeth, who would later become his wife. Now, what would be the chance on the best day of God's green earth that your grandmother would deliver you and your wife? If you don't believe in destiny, you will now. Cliff and Elizabeth were married for 57 years, and unfortunately she passed away in 2005. Cliff is a blessed man with two wonderful daughters here tonight and two great son-in-laws. His daughter Kay and her husband Peter, uh, they postponed the Florida vacation for three days and they're driving him to Florida in the morning. Clifton Foote has led a life of public service and has always given back more than he received. He was a volunteer fire department member for 44 years, serving 14 of those years as fire chief in Francistown. He also served his hometown in other capacity. He is a true giver, trustee of the trust funds, member of the road safety committee, fire ward, a member of the board of adjustment. Clifton, for you're being fitted here tonight by the Greater Peterborough Chamber of Commerce to honor you for the way you've chosen to lead your life and for selflessly serving your community for the greater good. And for this, we are all grateful to you. We're all richer because of you. Cliff, Jack Burnett and the Chamber couldn't have made a better choice than selecting you to be the first recipient of the Employee of the Century Award. Join me in congratulating Cliff Foot.
first employee of the century, but our last one. Thank you very much, and thank you, Jim, and congratulations, Cliff. Now, to uh, introduce our next award winner. Business Leader of the Year is one of the most important awards that is given out in this region. It's a great honor, and one of the things that's also great about it is the people who are asked to present it. So our presenter for our Business Leader of the Year Award is Dr. David Fleming. David?
think about it, none of those attributes were anything he has to work at. Blame his parents for, for his attributes. No, he didn't have to do it. He has the gift of specific knowledge. He has a community that needs his services. He's not interested in anything else. <laughs> and he works hard. I mean, but there's one dimension which I haven't mentioned yet. And that is the missus. Because the missus is what gives an entrepreneur the motivation to work. The missus is the one that kicks his ass and he doesn't do it. <laughs> and the missus is the one who does half the work anyway. <laughs> that is the variable. So when you think about it, this award might not go to Tom at all, but it might actually go to the missus instead.
So when I met with the MBB board, I kind of explained all this, and they all listened very patiently. And when I got to the end, John said, so, so why is it that you don't do the thing that everyone is asking you to do? <laughs> oh, I don't really have a good answer for that. So I quit saying no, and things took off. So, John, thank you for your sage advice. <laughs> I guess we've kind of come full circle, and uh, things have worked out okay. Um, and of course, I also want to thank our clients who had faith in us as we were trying to get this thing going. In fact, I think in the early days, maybe too much faith. I think back to some of the deals we closed we made and think, why in the heck did they choose us over our much more qualified competitors? But I'm glad they did, because we're here to tell about it. And, and I, of course, want to thank my really terrific staff. Um, you know, IT has a certain reputation. <laughs> Finding people who can do what we do and talk to other human beings, <laughs> it's challenging. <laughs> and we found the best. It is one of my greatest joys to have a client tell me about the great service they got from one of my people. So thanks to my team. And most of all, I want to thank my wonderful wife, Deb. She kept the faith when there really wasn't any reason to do so. She kept working full time so that we would have health insurance and food. And then in her spare time, she helped me run the business and provided balance to my thinking. And certainly we couldn't have done it without her. So thank you, sweetheart. So this isn't really about me. I'm really the spokesman here. Um, so let me tell you briefly about our business. As most of you know, we provide IT services for small and medium businesses. And here's our quick history. We started the business in 2000, July of 2002. A few months later, we moved to larger offices at MBV. In 2003, we hired our first part-time employee. In 2005, we moved again to bigger offices. And late in 2005, we hired our first full-time employees. And in September of 2009, we moved yet again to bigger offices where we are right now. We're now a firm of seven people. Um, and all those moves were scary, but every time we did one, it was like turning loose the straps and, and, uh, and suddenly the business expanded to fill the new space. We manage a little over 600 computers in 75 locations, mostly in New Hampshire, but also in Maine, Connecticut, New York, Illinois, Colorado, and Wyoming. So things have been have gone well. The last few years have been pretty exciting, uh, kind of hanging on as we grow. And we have some actually more exciting things in the works that we hope to be able to, to talk about very soon. And if that happens, we're going to be hiring. But all that's not really the point. Despite the hours that we put in, most of us aren't doing what we do because we just love our jobs. We're doing it because it gives us the life we want or we hope it eventually will give us. And that life that we seek is this community. It's our family and it's our friends and it's the organizations that fill this place that we live. Now, some of you all know I'm not from around here. <laughs> so let me tell you about your community from someone from outside. We live in a place that most people dream of visiting on vacation. We have mild summers, the most, spec most, most spectacular fall on the planet. And other than February, we got a winter that people come to take photographs of and paint paintings of. We enjoy a vibrant art and music community that's comparable to any large metropolitan area. We have good people and energetic organizations that make this a wonderful place to live. We have the most participatory government I have ever seen anywhere. We support growth, but we're careful about it. We're thoughtful.
thoughtful, we're deliberate, and sometimes we're hard-headed, but we're building a place that people want to live. And that's why my family chose this place. We weren't transferred here for a job. We weren't born here. We don't have family here. We chose to live here. And it sure feels like home. Now, some of you have heard about Sequoia Seeds, which is a program we started in 2007 to give back to the community. It was formed at the intersection between our love for the community and our genuine need to grow our business. And it's pretty simple. We ask each of our clients to choose the nonprofit that matters most to them, and then Sequoia makes an in-kind donation of 5% of that company's managed service fees to the nonprofit. The nonprofit can use it for computers, software, support, whatever they need. It's our way of making a difference and forming a few new connections between us and our clients and the nonprofit community that makes this such a wonderful place to live. At the end of March, we will have donated just over $30,000 to this program since 2007. It's not a huge amount. It's not a huge amount, but it's not bad for a fund our size, and we're very proud of that. Over that same period, our business has more than tripled. Now, I can't promise that Sequoia Seeds is the reason for that. I would be afraid to stop now. We are happy to share the details of this with anyone who wants to try it. We'll tell you what we got right, what we got wrong, and, and we'd love for you to, to steal this idea and create your own program. So, before Jack grabs the hook and pulls me off, because I'm, I'm way over my time, let me close. A few months back, Deb entered, attended a great workshop uh, hosted by NHBSR, Hampshire Businesses for Social Responsibility, a wonderful organization that helps businesses focus on community, uh, energy, environment, um, and, and we are glad to be part of it. And one of the things that came out of that workshop that I thought was really wonderful was, she, was a comment that, be the rudder, not the boat. I really like that. First off, we're not big enough to be the boat. So it, that's a relief. But that's okay, because you know what? This room is the boat. This community is the boat. We all are the boat. The other thing I like about it is the rudder's not in the front of the boat. It nudges the boat from behind. So here's my nudge. Steal our idea or create yours. But think about what you or your business can do to contribute to this wonderful community to make it even better than it already is. I promise you will not regret it. Our greatest success will be if we can steer the boat just a little bit. Thank you, sir. Fortunately for us all, um, Jim Callahan, uh, another friend of John, 
wants us to step forward to do it. So that was a good uh, solution all the way around. Jim uh, called me this past Wednesday and uh, told me that it was absolutely necessary for him to be out of town tonight. So he sends his, his regrets and his congratulations to John too. Um, but this means that I get to do what I wanted to do right from the beginning. So it's all good. Uh, I should also mention too that, uh, that Jim told me that he had spent more than five weeks trying to find something, anything, any type of dirt on John, he couldn't do it. <laughs> so I don't know whether that has to do with being out of town or not. Now John has brought with him tonight a, a pretty significant security detail. Um, so I just want to mention who they are, they don't have to stand up or anything, but I just want to mention them. They're his wife Judy, his daughters Katie and Holly, his daughter Juan Kristen, his grandson uh, Jason and his friend uh, Jen, and Judy's daughter uh, Kathleen. Now, uh, also with us tonight, of course, is John's son, John Jr., um, who, as many of you know, recently passed away. Certainly, the 350 people uh, who uh, came to his memorial service would agree with us that, uh, that his father is a very deserving uh, winner of this award. So, John Jr. lived a very caring and, and careful, uh, concerned, committed life, so it's very fitting that we remember him here tonight, too. So, just to start things off, I want, just like so you know, I'll know what we're talking about, John, would you just stand up so people can stand up so we know what we're talking about? In a nutshell, when you, as, as many of you know, the, the procedure for this, for Business Leader of the Year, Citizen of the Year, this is a nomination procedure, we get many, a number of nominees. Usually at least a half a dozen every year for each of those two. There are nominations, forms, recommendations, letters, photos, press clippings, and the whole deal. Uh, and uh, in all the things about John, uh, it was always, uh, they always were centered around three things. Downtown 2000, Manhattan Connect, and the Conval Community Scholarship Foundation. So we'll get to those very briefly, but uh, First of all, we need to get John here. So let me tell you just really a little bit about John. The more I found out about him, the more I realized he's sort of like a Forrest Gump type guy, like everywhere he goes, <laughs> running into these people, you know? Uh, he was born uh, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And uh, I told him I wouldn't give out his birth year. But uh, think Babe Ruth hitting 60 home runs. <laughs> and it was in 1972. Um, he, uh, like his, uh, like John was to be, John's father was in publishing. He was a production manager for the famous publisher Henry Luce. Um, helped start uh, Life Magazine, Fortune Magazine. Uh, in 1935, he took John to, uh, uh, to the Mercantile uh, operations in Nazi Germany. You know? um, John eventually got to know uh, the, the famous photographer Margaret Bourke White. That was pretty cool for us, you know. Um, John's father died at a young age. His mother got remarried to a man uh, who worked for Nelson Rockefeller uh, in the State Department. Rocky was the coordinator for Inter-American Affairs. I'm not going to go there, Chris Mann, Inter-American Affairs, you know. Um, at first I thought it was like, oh, that guy's Governor Sanford from South Carolina or whatever, but this was like diplomatic affairs. <laughs> But uh, John's stepfather was in charge of Argentina, and that's how John got to be, got to graduate, go to graduate from high school in Buenos Aires. Who would have thunk it, you know? Um, but that's what he did. Uh, he, uh, he ended up eventually going to Cornell, which he got to via steamship and uh, other means in 1944, was when he graduated from high school. Um, he got his degree from Cornell in international relations and economics. Then it was back to New York City, um, and where he became a roving ambassador for Quaker Oats in uh, South America, where his bilingualism was a, was a great asset, obviously. Eventually, he felt the lure of the advertising world, um, which led to a stint placing ads overseas for American companies. He became a college traveler uh, for McGraw-Hill, which meant that uh, he would go visit campuses and he would try to push McGraw-Hill books, but at the same time, he would try to uh, produce, you know, get manuscripts to publish in the books from the professors. Um, 30 years later, 30 years later, 
John was the Executive Vice President for Higher Education and Professional Publishing at McGraw-Hill. So that's quite a, that's quite a trip from college, that's quite a travel for a college traveler. <laughs> there were a few uh, notable stops along the way, not the least of which uh, by far was uh, in 1980 when he uh, married Judy. For the second time, he married Judy. First time was in 1979. Are you ready for this? They got married in a Las Vegas wedding chapel. You know, John and Elvis. Can you, you know, can you, can you picture that? So they did that, and finally, and I was saying before, really, part of this part of the evening wouldn't be happening if it weren't for Franklin Pierce College. Dr. Jamie Bird's president is here tonight because uh, the president of Franklin Pierce University, because in 1992. Uh, John Jr. went to Franklin Pierce. And the fact that John Jr. came here to go to Franklin Pierce is what brought John and Judy. As far as I know. Um, 1992 is perhaps a, the wrong year. but uh, So eventually John and Judy moved to uh, the Maples, the, the place called the, the Maples on uh, Old Jaffe Road, where David uh, Braun and Terry Reeves live now. Um, the uh, with his extensive experience in the business world. John eventually succeeded Larry Ross at Banana Business Ventures. Um, in 1995, Peter Burrow did a visioning study with a consultant, John, uh, Phil Hare. Um, John volunteered to be on the committee, and he and Brad Brighton chaired the business subcommittee of that. One of, the form, one of their recommendations was the formation of a downtown, uh, of a, of a nonprofit, to develop, uh, revitalize downtown Peterborough. So that led to downtown 2000. Without that, the street lighting and the whole Depot Square thing, thanks to investors like Sideway and Sam Fry and many other people involved. Without that, though, Peterborough, as we know it, really probably wouldn't exist. So John was the chair of it. John was involved in Leadership 2000, Class of 2000. And about that time, he became involved with Carol Monroe. I mean, um, he got became involved with Carol Monroe and others <laughs> in, in what became known as uh, in what became known as Manana Connect, which uh, between 2000 and 2005 um, worked to bring high speed internet to the region. What it really did, though, is it woke up Verizon to the fact that they needed to do something about that. And I should mention that Carol's now involved with the Fast Roads, which is sort of round two of that. John's a long-time member of the, uh, Peter, of the Chamber of Business Support Committee and Education Committee. It was about this time that John came into my office at the Chamber, and uh, he had been talking uh, with a number of people, he said, and uh, he was thinking about starting a scholarship foundation from scratch. Did I think it was possible, or did or, it or a good idea? So, thankfully, John, you know, doesn't need or get my okay to, to do anything. But I, you know, I said, well, you know, have you ever done anything like this before? And, and he said, no. I said, uh, why, would, why would you do this? And he said, well, because it needs to be done. Kids need more help. And I said, am I correct in thinking that you don't have any kids in the Conval system yourself? He said, you're correct. I said, do you have any money for it? He said, well, some from supporters, but not enough. And I said, well, how will you get the rest of the money? John said, collection jars. I said, good luck. <laughs> and off John went. So in case there's any doubt about it, uh, despite what he himself may say, or may have said in the past, or may say in the future, don't believe him if he tells you otherwise, because I'm telling, here to tell you that, that John single-handedly, single-handedly, created the Conval Community Scholarship Foundation. He met with scores or about hundreds of, of people and organizations. He recruited a board, he wrote the letters, the press releases, the newsletters, and he was personally responsible, personally responsible for altruistic reasons alone for the fact that it exists today. He's also responsible for its mentoring model, 
which uh, provides a personal ment mentor to every recipient for as long as needed, even after college, if that's, what, if that's necessary. And who are these people? Well, these, these CVCSF recipients aren't your ordinary scholars. They are very facing obstacles in their lives that seem impossible to overcome. But they are inspired by the Commonwealth Community Scholarship Foundation sort of mantra, which is face your challenges, aim higher, and achieve. And that's, that's John Vance. So far, a total of 22 scholars, all have done that, um, uh, have done just that, with another six to be named this year, to the tune of a total of $275,000. All because John didn't just think that kids need more help, he decided to go out and do something about it. So there you have it, a family that cares. Downtown 2000, Manandon Connect, Convow Community Scholarship Foundation, plus Elvis, you know? <laughs> so I ask you a question, can you imagine, can you imagine how much better a place our town and this region would be today than it already is if John and Judy had gotten here before they did? <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, introduce to you your 2011 Citizen of the Year, John Vance.
but that, that, that community of the Conn Valley Region Community Foundation and our, our objectives for that organization were three. One of them was to help a limited, a few uh, students who had obstacles to clear in order to have a shot at secondary, post-secondary education. The second was through them to set examples that would inspire others. But we can never provide all help for all the students who were there. And the third one was to help to create a sense of community around the convent school system. Is Mark Goody here tonight? I haven't, I haven't seen him. Well, one, of the, one of our great hopes, think back now four or five years ago, was that one day we would have a, a positive vote when it came around the budget and, and the contract for teaching staff. Well, we can't complain, we can't claim credit for maybe a half of 1% of the great results of our vote this year. But I hope that the Conville Community Scholarship Foundation contributed in some way to helping to develop that sense of the Conville school system of community. Jack, I think one other thing, Jack, Laura have done a magnificent job of raising this event. Enron would show up 
our community connections well so that we will live lives of purpose, integrity, and impact, making a difference where it really counts, and perhaps even leaving a legacy that reaches all the way into eternity. Good night, Lord. See you on the dance floor. Amen.